Our youth choir looks good today, don't they? There's a lot of energy up here. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to 1 John. And as we are making our way through 1 John, um, I just want to encourage you, a lot of times when we think entrance into Christianity as we open our heart up to Christ, that it's just kind of like it stops there at times. And, and I want you to understand that, biblically speaking, Christianity, that's the entry into, into Christianity, but it continues. Um, and you'll see in 1 John, especially, God is asking us for what we call ongoing obedience, or I think what modern writers call discipleship. I think in the modern world, I think uh, discipleship sometimes is a little bit different. It's um, we, we take a course or um, we have a class, or we memorize some scripture, but I love what Peterson's um, definition of discipleship, it's long obedience in the same direction. And so I think as we're called to that, and many of you recognize the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he was one of the, uh, the pastors that stood up against the Nazi regime, regime and, and really cost him his life. But he talks about cheap grace, grace that has no discipleship, grace that has no ongoing obedience, that you just receive God's grace, but you don't really act on it and do anything with it. And so he says cheap grace is grace without discipleship, Cheap grace is grace without the cross. And so as we are in 1 John today, and especially as we open up in chapter 2, verse 3, God is going to be calling us to take an exam. Now, while I was in Houston for 18 years, every Tuesday and every Thursday morning, I taught, the same, or taught at a university there, at a Baptist university. And the vast majority of those Tuesday and Thursday mornings, 8 o'clock, I would ask the class, at 8 o'clock, and they're not real lively at 8 o'clock, but I would say, everyone take out a piece of paper. It's time for a quiz. And so today, I'm going to ask you not to take out a piece of paper for a quiz. I'm asking each of you to take out your heart for a quiz. And in this quiz, it's a little different grading system because the quiz only asks one question. How many of you like quizzes with one question versus 100 questions? Which one would you rather prefer, 100 questions or one question? Well, I think our, our people here in Singapore know that it might need a little clarification. It depends on what that one question is, right? Now, on this one, obviously, it's only one question. This is a question, and it's for everybody here, not, not for the person next to you or behind you or in front of you, but it's for you. And we're asking you not, again, to take out a piece of paper, but to take out your heart to answer this question. The question is this, do you know God? Simple question, right? Some of us immediately say, yeah, I know it's G-O-D. It's, um, in, in my heart language, it's Shen. It's, it's, we, we know him, we come to church, and so we, we think, well, we know God. Well, the grading system is actually gonna be a little different too. It's not going to be an A or B or C or D. It's not going to be a 100 or 90 or 80 or 70. In fact, there's only two grades that are going to be rendered. And by the way, I'm not the one grading. In fact, it's going to be God and his word that's not going to grade your piece of paper. And then maybe not your voice or your words, but actually going to be grading your heart. And there's only two possible outcomes, pass or fail. You see, there's, there's no in-between with God. Uh, the, 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 there's either obey or disobey. It's either hate or love, which we'll see in the text a little bit later today. It's either, as we talked about two weeks ago, light or darkness. It's either zero or ten, right? There's no in-between. And so he's calling us to simply, do you know God? And so in these next couple of verses, there's going to be two evidences that John gives us that will be the exam of the heart, a test of the heart, of whether or not we can answer that question. And so there's going to be two evidences, and the first one is described in verses 3 through 6. And so this is what he says in verse 3. He says, by this we know that we have come to know him. And then if you have your text open, it has the condition or the test at the very end. So let me start again. It says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we what? Keep his what? Commandments. So the first test, the first evidence that we are to render, that we can answer the question, do you know God, is this. 
that you obey his commandments, that you keep his commandments. First test. And so as we begin, the test is knowing God. Now, in the secular world, especially in the first century, and maybe centuries a little bit before that with the Greek um, mindset, with Greek philosophers, they, they attempt to, to know their deities, and they often use what, what is often called human reasoning. So they would process, and if it's logic, if it makes sense, and we still use that today. A, a little bit later on in the Hellenistic period, it, it emerged with another test or, or way of knowing God, and it was through what they would call mystery religions, that would often be accompanied with incantations like uh, repetitive, repeative, repeating phrases again and again to kind of attract the gods or get into a, 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 a frenzy. And they would have rituals and sacrifices that would be accompanied to that. And that was the Greek mindset. Israel, though, said, how can we know God? And Israel had the, really the corner of the market. And it was by revelation where God just showed himself to Abraham where God showed himself in a burning bush to Moses, where God showed himself to the Israelites in the 10 plagues and the Exodus and all of that, showed himself to Isaiah, to, Isaiah, to, to, to the prophets, to David, King David. So we, we got this revelation, but here John is going to actually introduce another way of knowing God that's more than just knowledge and facts and data or, or that you're acquainted or that you're familiar. He's going to introduce a moral dimension. He's going to mention something that will affect your life. It's just not head knowledge. It's going to actually be in the area of obedience. Now we go back to verse 3. Look what it says. So this is the test. He says, by this we know that we have come to know him. Which is an interesting phrase because it uses the word know two times in the same verse. Now in English that makes like, why would he repeat himself like, by this we know that we have come to know him. But if you look at the original text, it actually gives you a distinction between those two verbs. And the distinction is what we would call the verb tense. And why, was that, why would that make it a, a, a difference or what kind of um, impact would that have? Well, the first one is in the tense that says, by this we come to know him. And the word know kind of has, we know and we keep on knowing. It's an ongoing knowledge that it never leaves you. That it's not like a one-off, like... Um, like, oh, I, I knew it yesterday. Like, let me give you an example. How many of you were here and you memorized Joshua 1.8 my first year here? Just raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to quote it. I'm just asking you if you memorize it. Raise your hand if you memorize Joshua 1.8. How many of you still remember it? Yeah, there's like a fewer number of that. <laughs> but see, we knew it, but we didn't keep knowing it. Well, this verb actually says not only do we know it, but we keep knowing. But what do we know? It says, by this we know that we have come to know him. Now the verb tense in the second know isn't like an ongoing um, knowledge. It actually speaks of a past event, a past um, uh, set of circumstances where something took place. And then the impact of that past event carries on today. So in this particular case... It says, we know, we continually know, we remind it, we don't forget that we have come to know Christ, which is actually a reference to your conversion. Like, I remember, like it was yesterday, that when I knelt down beside my father's bed when I was five years old, and he introduced the gospel to me, and I remember kneeling down on a wooden floor much like this one, and kneeling and asking Jesus into my heart. And I keep knowing that, obviously, we know but at the same time, I know of a past event where Christ came into my heart, and that has still made an impact upon me 50-plus years later. So that's the, the word to know. And so the emphasis is that there's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that it's not a data, it's not just knowledge, it's not just a cognitive concept, it, it's, it's not a, a mystery religion, it's not um, human reasoning, it's an intimate, ongoing, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he's introducing this one to us. Now, John, the same writer of this epistle, wrote a gospel called the Gospel of John. And it introduces a, an interesting dialogue between Jesus and one of his disciples in John chapter 14. And one of his disciples, his name is Philip. And Philip in John chapter 14, um, this is, again, he's been with Jesus three years. This is the night before the crucifixion. And Philip makes this kind of question statement kind of feel to it. He says, Jesus, show us the Father, 
and it will be enough. It will be sufficient. That's all we need. Now, you would think after walking with Jesus for three years, seeing miracles, hearing his teaching, seeing the, uh, hearing about the transfiguration, seeing him walk on the water, all of these things, and he then Philip kind of gets the audacity to ask him and the courage to say, show us um, the Father. We know you have access to him. Just show us the Father, and we, we, it'll be enough. But I want you to see how Jesus responds to Philip. This is what he says. It's quite, um, it, it's a turn of, of events. He says, how have I been with you so long, and yet you still have not come to know me? So for three years, Philip hung out with Jesus, and Jesus is making this assessment of Philip. He said, Philip, how have you been with me so long, and you don't know me? Because if you know me, you would know the Father. I think many of us may, in this simple test, do you know God? We may actually fall into what I call the Philip category. Like, we, we say we know God, but yet you've been around, maybe for years, and yet, like Philip, you don't know who he is. You, you, you have an acquaintance, you have a familiarity, but if he was to ask, show me the Father, Jesus, and it will be enough, and Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm wondering how many of us have that type of knowledge, that we are aware, that we're acquainted, that we've acknowledged, but yet we really do not understand who Jesus is. So again, the one question we're asking again on this quiz of the heart is, do you know God? Well, then there are two evidence. There's t- there's th- the test is very simple. It's at the end of verse 3. It says, by this we know, we keep on knowing, that we have come to know him in the past, and the impact is still going, if we keep his commandments. The word keep means to literally guard. It's a military term. It means to protect. I'm about to um, go see my grandson, but every time I call Sasha, she's holding something. Can you imagine what she is? She's holding that grandson. I'm going, I wonder if she's going to share at all. But the way she's holding it, I'm going, I, I, holding him, I'm not so sure. But she's guarding him. He's only eight days old. And so I, I get that sense that that word keep, protect, guard is the same word. So he's, he's, it says, if you know me, if you truly know me, not like Philip who's acquainted with me and says, God, show, or Jesus, show us more. And, and he missed Jesus completely of who he was. He says, but if you keep his commandments, you will know me. If you guard, if you treasure, if you protect. And it's not talking about a one-off. It's not talking about when you're in the mood. Like even on Sunday morning at 1115, we obey God. But at 115 this afternoon, we'll do our own thing. God says, if you know me, you will not only keep, but you'll keep on keeping, you will keep on guarding, you'll keep on holding, you'll keep on protecting this treasure, ongoing obedience. This is a test. Do you know God? You can say whatever you want to say, but the key is if you keep his commandments. A little girl had walked into a a store, and there was a beautiful doll there, and and she really, really coveted it. She really wanted her. And she nor her mom had money to buy it. And that wasn't the plan. They were just looking. And so she kind of slipped away from her mom. And she got to the doll. And she grabbed it. And she put it in her jumper. And she hid it. And she walked. And she was trying to walk out of the store with it. And her conscience was very convicted. And she couldn't do it. And so she kind of slipped underneath the radar again in a, in a selfie kind of way and, and got back there and put the doll back in its original place. And then she joined her mom and, and they were kind of about to leave the store and she just couldn't take it anymore. Her conscience was beating on her so much and she had to tell her mom what she did and she did. She, she told her mom exactly what she did and what happened. And then she made this assessment and I'm wondering how many of us we fall in this. She said, mom, I don't think I broke one of the commandments. I think I might have cracked it, though. <laughs> and I'm wondering how many of us, we may not smash the commandment, but maybe we tweak it a little bit. Maybe we revise it a little bit. Maybe we jar it a little bit. Maybe we um, crack it just a little bit. It's not that big of a deal, Pastor, really. Come on. And yet, God's Word says the test of whether or not we know Him. Simple question, do you know God? God's Word is very clear when it comes to it. If you do, you keep, you guard, you protect. Ongoing obedience, not no one-offs, not just when it's convenient or when you're in the mood or when it fits your schedule. 
It includes it when you're tired, when the demands are there, when you've lost your job, when the grades that have come in and they're lower than you thought they were, when the pressure of your parents are on you, when all the expectations are on you, when, when, when you're going through physical illness, when you're being tested in every way. God says, if you keep, if you protect, if you keep on God and my commandments and my treasure. God says, this is what he's asking. So what commandments are they talking about? Look in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. Obviously, there's a bunch of commandments, but I think John has two in mind, specifically. He says, this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded. So what commandments are we to keep? Well, obviously a lot, but two specifically, belief. How do you know you're, you know God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? How do you know that you know God if you keep, if you believe, if you protect, if you hold on to the fact and obey that you love those around you? That's how you know you keep his commandments. Well, that's the test. Now, what are the two possible responses? There's going to be two. The first one's going to found, be found in verse 4. The second one's going to be found in verse 5 and 6. So verse 4, these are responses. Again, the question, do you know God? The test is if you keep his commandments. Verse 4, I would call it, and I'm going to categorize this as the one who says or the one who speaks. So it says, if one says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, what does your word say? There's an assessment. He is a what? Liar. And what is not in him? The truth. So let's see what that looks like. So this is a person who says, who professes. So obviously there's a distinction between what you say and what you do. But if you say, if you claim, if you articulate, if you verbalize, hey, I, I, I know him. I, 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 I know God. I come to church at IBC. I, I, I know scripture. I, 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 I've been on mission trips. I, I know that. I, I know him. And so there's that claim that there's an intimate knowledge of God. But yet the word of God says, the one who says, but yet now he does not keep and he's disobedient. He defies. He, 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 he stands against. He, he's in opposition to the commandments of God. He does not guard. He does not keep. He does not protect. He's not obeying continuously. There is a double assessment. The first asset assessment is what we just said, that if you do not keep his commandments and you say, I've come to know him, number one, you're a liar. By the way, this is not me speaking he said, Pastor, that's offensive. I, I, I'm, I'm just passing to you what the Word of God says. For those who say, Pastor, I'm a Christian. I know God. But yet your life is full of disobedience. You defy. You rebel. You disobey. You crack the commandments. You break. And yet you still say, I, I know God. The Word of God says you lie. What does lie mean? It means not only that you do not tell the truth, you stand in opposition to the truth. One writer said it pretty well. He says it's kind of like an extraction of truth or an appendectomy of integrity, that there's been a surgical removal. He says that you're a liar, and, and John chapter 8 calls somebody else a father of lies. Who is that? Who's the father of lies? Satan. Satan. So the moment you claim, I know him, and yet your life is persistently disobedient to the things of God, God says, you've made an alignment with Satan who is in opposition to God. Second assessment is not only are we a liar if we say that we know God and our life is persistently in disobedience and defiance, it says that also the truth is not in us. Now, why is that so astounding and profound? Well, what is truth? In John's gospel, Jesus says these words, I am the way and the what? Truth and the life. So what is not in you if you persistently disobey? Jesus Christ. That's not me making the assessment. That's the word of God. If you say, I know him, and yet you do not, pers and if you continually to persistently disobey the truth, Jesus Christ, not only is the truth of Jesus Christ not in you, but the word is not in you as well. The word is the truth. There's no voice. There's no call of Christ. There's no presence. So you can't claim, I know Christ, if you're in perpetual disobedience. 
If you're persistently defying and resistant and saying no to God when the song just said, I said yes, but you're saying no or your life says no, then God's word says we're a liar and the truth is not in us. I'm telling you, it's almost like you just can't disobey God and still claim to be a follower. It's like people who say, Pastor, I'm married. And here, here's my certificate of marriage. I got it at the ROM, and, and I'm married. But um, you're in an adulterous affair. You have a mistress. He said, but I'm married. I said, are you? The paper says I'm married. But what you, remember, this is not an examination on paper. This is an examination of your heart. If you've broken that covenant, if you've been in an adulterous affair, is it not hypocritical? Is it not a farce? Is it, is it not a facade to say, oh, pastor, I'm married, but yet in life and heart, you're not acting like it. Is it not that much more true here in church that if you say, pastor, I'm a believer, I know God, and yet your life is absolutely in opposition to him. The truth is not in you. You're a liar if you do not obey and persistently follow Jesus Christ. You're going, is that even possible? Are you asking me to be sinless? No, God is not saying that at all. But he says if you're persistent, yes, we do stumble, we do fall. In fact, this past week I got several emails from last week's sermon that says, are you calling us to be, is God calling us to be sinless and to be perfect? No, 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 not at all. But if your obedience is, is, is consistent, and your disobedience and defiance is, 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 you're maintaining that. And there's no conviction. There's no movement away from, away from that sin. Then at least it begs the question, something may be off. And the word of God is very clear about that. Well, on the other hand, the, 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 the one who does. So let's go to verse 5. So the one who says, I have come to know him but disobeys and does not keep his commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Verse 5 offers the other option to respond, and my prayer is this will be your response. It says the one who abides in him. Now, that's the, that's the one, I mean, whoever keeps his word. So the opposite of the one who says and disobeys is the one who keeps. And again, the word keeps means that you're persistently obedient to the things of God. That you long for the word of God. That you, you, you even though you mess up, you, cor- you correct it immediately. God says if you keep his word, then the assessment, you have two benefits that, that actually happen to you and that you are a recipient of these benefits. The first one says that in him, the love of God truly has become, has been perfected. Now, it's amazing. As you obey God, God's love actually becomes more and more evident, more and more full, more and more complete, more and more expressive in such a way that the longer you obey, the more you obey, you begin to love the things of God that God loves. Now, check what you love. God says, whenever you obey me, you keep, you guard, you protect my word, The love of God has been perfected. Now, it's not us, the one who's doing the perfected and making whole. The the, the wording is in such a way that that action is being done to us, which implies God is the one that is perfecting it and bringing it to maturity and bringing it into fullness. So as we obey God, our capacity to love actually increases. Our capacity to long Now, there's usually three reasons why people do what they do. Now, obviously, there's going to be a lot of variables within these three big categories, but here they are. First of all, you do something because you have to do it. Second, you do something because you need to do it. And the third one is, anybody can guess, you do it because you what? You want to do it. So let me ask you, why are you keeping his commandments? Well, if it's have to, it's like a slave with a master. You have to. That's, That's just, you have to. There's no option. Now, you need to, and need to is a little bit different, right? Need to is like a child at home. You need to be obedient to your parents. But obviously, they exercise other options, do they not? Or you tell your kids, you need to study. How many of you parents say amen to that, right? So you need to do that, but yet you, you end up not always doing it. So those are the need to. And by the way, women and men, you need to get a job. You need to work. Why? Because you need money to, to provide for your family. Then does that mean everyone goes and works? No. But you need to do that. But the last one 
is, do you want to do it? Now, if you want to do it, it changes everything, doesn't it? It says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The highest motive for obedience, yeah, we need to do it out of diligence and we need to do it all of that. But it says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So what Jesus is looking for among us, if we're going to be obedient, is that the love of God is truly becoming perfected inside of us. The second benefit is found in verse 6. It says, he who says he abides in him ought himself to walk as he himself in the same manner as he walked. So the second benefit of obedience is not only having God perfect and mature the love of God inside of us, secondly, we become Christ-like. We take up a resemblance of him. So the more we obey God, the more we look like Christ. The, the more that we copy his behavior. So we walk as he's walked. Now, some of us can literally take that, oh, we walk as he's walked. So a guy in Scotland several years ago took this literally and says, I'm going to walk as Jesus walked. So he took a cross and walked across Scotland with a cross because Jesus carried his cross. Now, as I read the end of the story, I, I noticed that he didn't really walk as Jesus walked because he just carried the cross. What happened after Jesus carried the cross? What happened to him at the end of that? Yeah, he, he, that guy in Scotland didn't do that. So here he is, like, I'm going to walk as Jesus walked. I'm just going to carry the cross. I'm just not going to die on the cross. Well, somebody said, well, walking as Jesus walked, does that mean go back to the Sea of Galilee and get out of the boat and walk on top of the water? Is that walking as Jesus walked? And obviously not. Literally, it says walk as Jesus walked in the same manner. But what it means is you need to walk in his footsteps, that you need to follow him that you need to give way to him, that you need to yield to him, that you need to obey him. So what does that look like? Well, then if we're going to walk as Jesus walked, then we're going to love as Jesus loved. And Jesus loved those outsiders. But if we don't look at those outsiders, we, we, we name those those people. Are we loving as Jesus loved? Are we looking for the Samaritans in our life? Are we looking for the lepers in our life that no one else touches, that no one else hangs around? The more we obey God, the more Christ-like we become. And the more Christ-like we become, we begin to act and do what Jesus did. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Are we washing the disciples' feet? Are we waiting to be attended to? Are we waiting to be served? See, if we're going to walk as Jesus walked, then we're going to have the same compassion that he has. That we're going to cross the barriers. That we're going to speak and respond as he speaks and as he responded. So God is calling us if, simple question, right? Do you know God? So we come to halfway, we call it halfway through the exam. First question, or the only question is, do you know God? And what's the first evidence? What does it say in verses three through six? What's the first evidence of whether or not we know God is what? Our obedience. Test, if you keep his commandments. You have two possible responses according to John. The one who says, I've come to know him but does not keep his commandments, and God assesses that as a, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. But the other, other possible response is those who keep his commandments, those who protect and guard his commandments. And it says in his word that if we do that, in us, in you, the love of God truly has been perfected, that we begin to love the things that God loves. Just take a quick exam. What do you love? Pastor, I need my Korean dramas. <laughs> You know, I love shopping. I love uh, whether, whatever sport it may be. I, I, I'm just asking, do you love what Jesus loves? That's a very, very simple question. And we walk in the same manner as he walked. Are our actions, could it be identified that our actions actually match in parallel that of Jesus Christ? So how are you doing on your exam so far? Do you know God? Now we come to the second part, verses 7 through 11. So do you know God? So, um, John completes or starts his next paragraph, and I love how he starts it. He says, beloved. Now John's 90 years old, and he's calling them beloved, right? But this is the first time in, of six times that he uses beloved in 1 John. And I always think he's about to tell people to love one another, right? I don't think it's very effective to tell people to love one another and scream at them at the same time. Would you think? You need to love each other. And I've seen marriages where you, they're shouting at them, you need to love me. I don't know if that's the most effective way to communicate. So John is about to tell people to love one another, and this is what he says, beloved. Gentle, right? 
And he says, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. Now, everything is cool there, verse 7. Verse 8 is a little bit more confusing, though, right? It says, on the other hand, I'm writing a what? Anybody see the text? I'm writing a what? A new commandment. It's like, John, make up your mind. Is it old? Is it new? It's confusing. Um, Let's go back to the first one, the old commandment. The old commandment, John's writing it probably 50 to 60 years after Jesus gave him the original commandment. So that's kind of old, right? That's something that we may have um, cited maybe 1960, 1970 from our time. So that's an old commandment. It, It could even go further back. If you go back into the Old Testament, it could be Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It says, love your neighbor as what? Yourself, right? So that's a real old commandment. That's like 1,500 years before, 1,600 in John's perspective. That's an old commandment. The old implies that it's not novel. It's not new. It wasn't just given to us yesterday. It's been here for a while. In fact, the ancient history of it actually kind of authenticates its authority, So it's an old commandment I give to you, which you've heard, which was from the beginning, which you've heard. So this old commandment. But then Jesus, then he says in verse 8, on the other hand, I'm going to give you a new commandment. So what is he referring to? Well, you go back to John chapter 13. Jesus says, "A, a, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you love one another. So what's the newness? It's the same commandment, love but he's increased the intensity. He's increased the, the, the cost and the sacrifice. Now, I, I, this has always been confusing to me, like old and new and all of that stuff, but maybe this will help you. I, um, I, I've, I'm, not a good, I'm not a good cook. I, I cook certain dishes, especially when Sasha's gone, I've got to cultivate some um, culinary skills. But um, sometimes I just like to cook eggs. But my eggs aren't that good. Like from a scale from zero to 10, my eggs are like a two or three. Like I wouldn't ask you to come over and say, hey, you've got to try my eggs. Like I'm not going to invite you over and cook eggs, okay? So I'm, 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 I, I, I'm self-aware when it comes to the quality of my cooking. So that's what I throw in all kinds of things to try to like one day eggs are going to just appear to be really good. It hasn't happened yet, but I keep trying. But a couple weeks ago, I visited one of our members in their home, and it's an emerging chef. Okay? And so we were chatting and we were talking and you know in all the TV shows and the movies that come out with chefs, what's the, like, the guideline of whether or not somebody's a good chef? Like it's a test, right? You have to know how to cook what? Eggs. I mean, that's, the, that's how you teach, it, the, even the premier chefs, it's always how do you do eggs? And so I, I was talking to her about it and I said, she, she said, yeah, I, I do eggs and I got the highest marks and you know, I said, it's eggs, come on. What can you do to eggs? Like, I, she said, let me show you. I said, okay. So we all hovered around the stove in the kitchen. We took the video out. And she just started making eggs, scrambled eggs. Seems like a simple job, right? But she did some things, and she walked us through each step. And I promise you, when I put those eggs in my mouth, it was a new commandment. <laughs> Something radically changed. I'm going... I almost am in the nursing home, and I would not have eaten these eggs if I would not have come to your house. It took me this long of life to eat eggs like this. And so over the last next couple of weeks, I made some for Sasha, and she says, I think she was just being nice to me. She says, these are delicious, hon. But I think what happens is the old way I was making it was okay because they're eggs. But there's a new way of making it that's even much, much better. And so Jesus says, or John says, an old commandment I give to you, which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is that what you have heard. But on the other hand, a new commandment. So this is increasing its intensity. It's the same content, intensity and sacrifice. So in this, it's going to offer two options. If you see the end of verse 8, it says, on the other hand, a new commandment I'm writing to you, which is in him, which is true in him, which is in Christ, but it's also in you. So if you truly have this love, which is evidence that you know God, and it's not only in Christ, but it's in you, then it says two options you have. It says darkness is passing away, but the true light is already shining. So you have these two options when you come into love. If you choose not to love, you go into darkness, which is passing away. 
So it's, it's obviously absence of light, absence of love, but also it means that, it's, that light is, with the coming of Jesus Christ, the, the, the darkness is diminishing, it's passing away, it's no longer going to have its hold on us. But the true light is already shining, which is the light of the world, which means that that brightness is going to get bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter, while the darkness is going to get less and less and less. So what are the two possible responses to the second evidence? Remember, the first test was if you keep his commandments, right? The second test is if you love as Jesus loved. So what's the possible responses? The first response is the same way that we just did in the first point, is verse 9 and verse 11. Look what it says in verse 9. The one who says, again, that's the one who speaks, the one who articulates, the one who says he is, he is in the light, but, what's the but? But what? Hates is what? Brother is in the darkness until now. Verse 11, the one who hates his brother is in what? What does it say in verse 11? The one who hates his brother is in what? In the darkness. Not only in the darkness, it says, and walks in the darkness. And it doesn't even stop there. And does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded his eyes. So let's walk through that briefly. So what is the possible response? The question is, do you know God? Simple question. And if you say, Pastor, I know God, then you have to have two evidences. First is you have to obey and keep his commandments, ongoing, persistent obedience. And if you don't, if you just say, I know God, God says, if you do not keep his commandments persistently, consistently, habitually, then God's word says you're a liar and the truth is not in you. But if you keep his commandments, the word of God says, hey, that, that, that love is being perfected inside of you. And second, that you become Christ-like, that you walk in the same manner as he's also walked. Now we come into the second test. So the first one said, the, the one who says that, hey, I, I, I'm in the light, but hates his brother. Now the word hate is a, a pretty cruel word, right? Um, a lot of times we associate hate with, it's a strong emotion, we so associate hate with homicidal Associations. I mean, that's, it's very clear. Go back to 1994 in Rwanda, where one million people were killed, right? One million people. But if you dig a little deeper into the, like, who are they? 70% they, of those who were killed in Rwanda comes from two predominant tribes. And out of those tribes, 58% were Catholic. 15, 16% were Protestant. A little over 6% were Seventh-day Adventists. And guess what they were doing? Let me translate, or maybe say it in a different way. Christians killing Christians. 1994, we would all say that's hate. That's homicidal tendencies, right? Several years ago, I was in Manipur, India, northeast India. And some of you know that location up there. And in Manipur, India, 25% of all Manipurians in the state of Manipur are Baptists. But in that state, there are 29 different tribes and all of them have Baptists in each tribe. But if you uh, pull back the history a little bit, several years ago, tribes were killing each other. But really, I don't call them tribes. They were actually Baptists killing Baptists. Now, we associate hate with that, right? That homicidal killing. You said, Pastor, I don't hate anybody. I ain't killed anybody this week. Well, well let me kind of maybe refine and maybe expand, perhaps, your definition of hate by using Jesus' words in Luke chapter 6, verse 22. He says these words, blessed are you when people hate you. Interesting blessing, right? But then he expands. He says, blessed are people when people hate you, ostracize you, and insult you. I think there are maybe more ways to express hate than killing them. I think there are more subtle forms like what he says. When you ostracize somebody, when you isolate them, is that showing love to them? Absolutely not, right? So what are you showing? According to the word of God, you're showing an expression of hate. If you insult somebody, if you, if you, if you throw an insult, that's a form of hate. If you treat them as unimportant and irrelevant and not, not, not a factor, is that not, that's not love, right? That's hate. 1 Corinthians 13, which you'll hear in a couple weeks, it says love is not rude. So if you're rude, what are you doing? That was a question, by the way. What are you doing? Hate. The opposite of hate is, uh, love is hate. 
You said, no, Pastor, I just don't love them. Well, the word of God says is either you have choices, either love or hate. So it comes in all kinds of forms that may not be like the massacre in Rwanda in 1994 where a million lost their lives. It may just simply be you insulting somebody or you're avoiding somebody. You're treating somebody as unimportant. Pastor, I don't hate my husband. I just ignore him. Well, guess what? Biblically, what you're doing. And the word of God says, if you're going to love God, if you're going to walk with God, if you're going to know God, you cannot hate your husband. You cannot hate your wife. Well, I haven't killed him yet. But when we ostracize, when we insult, when we treat them as irrelevant or immaterial, God says, this is in the same category of hate. Some of you recognize the name George Bernard Shaw. He was an Irish playwright. He had an interesting relationship with Winston Churchill. They were kind of always at each other and always jabbing each other. And so George Bernard Shaw um, sent Winston Churchill two tickets to uh, his play that was opening up. And he wrote this little note, which is you you kind of have to know the antagonism between those two characters. And he said, "Um, I'm sending you two tickets, um, and I want you to use them for my opening play. um, And I want you to bring you, and and if you can find a friend, (laughs) bring, bring that friend. Obviously a jab, right? Well, Winston Churchill wasn't known for his grace and his mercy and his kindness. And he sent a note immediately. says, I would be glad to come to the opening, but I'm unable to attend. But I will be glad to make it to the second night if the show is still open. <laughs> so we may not, like, viciously kill somebody, but I'm wondering if the words that we use and the attitudes that we project the condensation, the isolation, the avoidance, the insults. Is that not hate as well? Now, that's, it says, if you, if you say, again, you say, oh, pastor, I'm in the light, I'm walking with God, and yet you insult, you ostracize, you isolate, you, 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 you cut. The word of God says, not only are you in darkness, you're in darkness until now. Then verse 11 elaborates a little bit more in depth, and this is where it gets kind of, you have to peel back what God is saying to you. So if you're here today and you have hate, and again, you may have not harmed or or, or killed somebody, but you've used these other elements. God's word says, if you hate your brother in verse 11, you are in darkness, which is an interesting, absence of light, right? No doubt. But it's also absence of love. Not only have you separated yourself from the, the light of the world, you also separate yourself from the children of light. This is why you really don't want to come to church. Or when we have Connection Sunday, this is why you leave early. Because <laughs> you don't want really that connection because it's, 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 it's light. And it says you're in darkness, and so there's an absence of this. But a lot of times we, we look at the word darkness and we, we kind of equate it to physical darkness. Like if you walk into a dark room, it's just dark, you know, it's just there. But this is not a, a, a simple existence of, a, of a no light. This darkness is actually a power that assaults, that attacks, that, that, that dismantles, that destroys. So it's not like just walking into a dark room. It's being attacked by darkness. It's, it's on the offensive. It's not a passive kind of existence, darkness. Oh, Pastor, I can live in darkness. It's okay. No, let me tell you, if you're living in darkness, you're being attacked. You're being destroyed. You're being dismantled. That's what the word darkness means in Scripture, the powers of darkness, right? But it doesn't stop there, so it's bad that you don't love your brother, but you hate them. You hate your family member. You hate this worker. You hate your job, uh, your, your, your boss, your, whatever it is. God says you're in darkness, so that's your, obviously your, your, your station, your status. But it doesn't stop there. It says, but you also walk in darkness. Why would he add something like that? Well, because it tells us some, a very deep spiritual truth that if you choose to hate and not love, not only are you in darkness, but you, and you begin to walk in darkness. What does that mean? It means that you actually go further into darkness. There's no such thing as status quo in darkness. You're actually getting worse. Every moment that you stay in darkness, you're not staying still. You're actually walking further into that realm and that domain of darkness. This is really critical that we understand that we've gone across the threshold and now we're moving. 
And so I think a lot of times, like in this walking, not only are we in darkness, but we walk in darkness, then we begin to justify our behavior, do we not? And we start changing the way we work. Like so many people, how many of you know, and I don't want you to point at them right now, but how many of you know somebody with a critical spirit or a judgmental attitude? Just raise your hand if you know somebody. Not point at them, just how many of you know, how many of you don't know anybody with an, a, a judgmental spirit or critical spirit? Okay, I, I, if you don't know anybody, I've got a lot of people I want to introduce you to. Okay, a judgmental attitude or critical spirit. But you know what, in the body of Christ, when they, somebody has a judgmental attitude or a critical spirit, you know what we call it? Pastor, I have the gift of spiritual discernment. <laughs> like, I can just discern between good and evil. And pastor, they're evil. <laughs> My husband's wicked. My wife is, oh, shit. It's like, oh. And, and, but you know, a lot of times when we exercise the spiritual discernment, there's no love, right? So we take that judgmental attitude and critical spirit, and all of a sudden we call it spiritual discernment. I think sometimes when we, uh, we just say, hey, pastor, this is just the way I'm made. I'm made to, to, to have 10 affairs. I'm made to get drunk every night, every, every weekend. I, 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 I just, I'm made this way. And so we, we, we say that, and then we blame God for the way we're made. Then, then we take these fleshly desires, and we, we, we call it, well, we, we have liberty in Christ. We call it Christian liberty. Or we take the word lust, and we turn it to love. And it's not love, it's lust. So if you're in the darkness, God says you just don't stay there. You actually walk and get deeper in the darkness. The last phrase is really the one that captures your, the, the, the finality of it. It says not only are you in the darkness if you hate your brother and you express that, at, even though you make the claim, I, I know God, if you hate your brother, you're not only in the darkness and walk in the darkness. It says, you do not know where you're going because the darkness has blinded your eyes. In John 12, 40, Jesus says to those who are religious but they're not believing in Jesus, it says, God has blinded your eyes of those, those who are believing. Then in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul says, in the case of the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they may not see the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ in his glory who's in the image of God. So you get that sense that blindness is like a, a little bit deeper than just being in the darkness and walking in the darkness. In Bogota, Colombia, there was a mom that, a young mom that brought her 10-month-old baby into the hospital. He was suffering from chronic and, and very serious diarrhea. And it was very intense, and she was kind of desperate. And so she brought him in, too, and they, they immediately admitted the little 10-month-old ten J- Jason to um, the intensive care unit, the ICU unit. But they wouldn't let the mom stay overnight because of all the, the wires and all the, uh, the visiting hours and everything. And so she had to let the little one go, and she went home and came back early the next morning. To her shocking surprise, she got there. And remember, the little 10-month-old girl, uh, little boy had chronic diarrhea, and she walked in and saw him, and he had bandages over his eyes. She called the doctor and said, why would you have bandages over my son's eyes? He had chronic diarrhea. She said, oh, he's about to die. The doctor said, oh, he's about to die. We're about to lose him, and just walked out the door. Well, obviously, it wasn't that trustworthy of a doctor, so she took the child herself and went to another hospital and had another doctor evaluate and, and and to her shocking surprise, says, what they've done to your son is they've stolen his eyes. They've removed his eyes to feed the black market of corneal transplants. How horrific and horrible that is, there is another one that is stealing our eyes, that we cannot see the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you hate your brother, you begin to lose your eyesight. When you hate your family member, when you hate your friend, when you hate a brother and sister in Christ, and pray to God you're not hating your pastor right now. <laughs> God says, not only are you in darkness, not only are you walking further and plunging into darkness, God says, now darkness has blinded you. So the opposite of this is, is found in verse 10. And so what's the other possible response? The one who says and the one who does, right? And so in verse 10, it says, the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. And so the word of God says, if you love, and that's the evidence, 
that you know God and if you love him, it says you abide, you, 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 you walk, you live in the light. Kind of shocking distinction between those who hate and who walk in darkness and live in darkness and are blinded. But then it says there's no cause for stumbling. Fifteen times the word stumbling is used in the New Testament and it always results in some type of harm. And in this case, you would be plunged back into sin. But yet you walk in the light so there's no cause for stumbling for you. There's no cause for you to lose your footing or there's no cause for you to slip into sin. Like that little girl when she stole that little doll that now she had the light that says something's wrong so she puts it back. And her light even says, I may have not broken the commandment, I may have cracked it, but at least she's dealing with it instead of changing the definition of a thief to a cost of living adjuster, right? So now... If we walk in the light, does it mean we're sinless? Absolutely not. Does it mean we're perfect? No, 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 no. But it does mean that we're able to see and not only keep us from stumbling, but to keep others from stumbling. When it says, fathers, do not provoke your children, you know what? When we sin as fathers and provoke our children, who do we cause to stumble? Not only ourselves, but whom? Our children. See, our stumbling Our dark walk, our walking darkness, not only damages and hurts us, but damages and hurts those who love us and those who are around us. And will affect not only you, but your family and the generations to come. So today, we're calling you to a simple expression, simple test, not on paper, but on your heart. Question is this, do you know God? Pastor Phil, No A, no B, no C, no D, no 100, no 90, no 80, no 70. Either you obey or disobey, either you hate or you love, either you're in light or in darkness, no in between. Have you passed the test? What are the two evidences? It says first, your obedience gives evidence that you're a child of God, that you know him. Second, and that obedience is consistent, persistent, not on and off whenever you want to. Number two, if you have love for your brothers, a new commandment I give to you. And that you walk as Jesus walked. We're going to come to a time of expressing this love. And we do it by taking up an offering. And I think the offering represents so many things, right? It not only represents what God has given us and has blessed us and has given us freely, but we can freely give back to him as well. But it also represents, it may be an amount that we're given, but it represents a gift of ourselves, Romans 12 says it really clearly, that you present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So when we give our offering, it's a sign, it's an indicator that we're also giving ourselves to God. And so as we pass the the, the offering in just a moment in the bag, I'm going to challenge you. If you don't have any money, that's not even the issue today. The issue today is, have you offered yourself in obedience Have you kept his commands? Have you loved those around you? I'm gonna pray that you take this simple test. And as we get our hearts ready for what God has in store for us, let us pass this test. My prayer is that you will pass this test today by knowing God, by simply obeying and loving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts for the offering. Father, we come to you this morning with a heart that's ready not only to receive your word, but to respond. Father, there's so many here that claim and say, I've come to know you. Now, whether that is verbal or not, Father, the question then comes in, what is the proof and what is the evidence of that? Father, your word says that if we know you, we would obey you that we keep your commandments, that we would abide in the light, that we would walk as you walked. Father, it says, if we know you, we also love those around us with the love that you have. Father, I pray today as we take that heart exam, and Father, as your word and you grade our exam, Father, I pray that that would be a passing mark today. And Father, as a result of that, that we would give freely because you freely have given to us. Father, we pray that you would not only bless those Uh, Bless the offering that's given of of just the financial resources. But, Father, more so, bless the one who offered not only the financial resources, but themselves. Father, we want to be obedient to you. Here we are. Prepare our hearts now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.